you know, that, that's what I do. It, it really, you have no idea how hard it is for the Hokamina people to stand behind this. You know, and, and the threats of the litigator negotiate policy, some of the things the government has done to us, I will tell you that I got an email today that Revenue Canada has contacted the University of Arizona and they said they're doing an audit and they want a list of all Canadians that have donated to any organization in the University of Arizona. Oh. And that includes both my colleague, Jim Anaya, who's a UN Special Rapporteur who's funded by grants, uh, and my program as well. Like I said, it's hockey with you guys all the time. And we've had situations where one of our First Nations was approached uh, right before we were um, ready for our uh, oral argument in D.C. One of our First Nations was approached by the government and said, if you pull out of this case, we'll negotiate a separate treaty with you and give you some housing that you really need. We spent a lot of time working with the community and they've been incredibly strong. They've had every reason not to push for this case, but they've been behind us every, every inch of the way. So they're really, I mean that, they, they really deserve the applause. They are fighting one of the most important, and, and we've been told this, this is one of the most important human rights cases of the 21st century. And if we can establish that the Canadian system, with all its sophistication and protections, is inefficient, you can, ma you can imagine the ripple effects. And the fact that Canada takes these, you know, people say, well, why do you bother the international law? Canada doesn't care. Canada didn't care. Why did they follow a 1,200-page response? Why are they auditing human rights groups that support indigenous peoples? They care. They care tremendously. And that's why we're engaged in this battle. So I'm happy to answer questions. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you know, that's so many places to help. Um, and with your government and the Harper government, and I know you're having a new election, um, it, it, it's not going to happen through litigation. Um, those mandates of the government have to change. That I think that both um, private citizens, the extractive industries, who have an interest, I mean, the entire economic development of, of your province hinges on fair resolution of these treaties, economic and community development for non-Indigenous as well as Indigenous Canadians. And so it really has to change at those mandates at the, at the treaty table. The government's insistence that compensation is not on the table, the government's insistence on a municipal model of government, instead of recognizing that, that pressure has to be bought, put on politicians to change those mandates. And Robert can probably give you a lot better ideas than I can. Um, but that's a great question. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it's been my understanding, maybe I'm uh, incorrect, that uh, the 1973 uh, uh, Comprehensive Land Claim Settlement Policy circumscribes all the treaty process in Canada since that time in the country. Absolutely. And they require, under this uh, circumscription, they require the Native communities, which are on as nations, to remove themselves from the jurisdiction of the Indian Act. Is that right? That's, that's my understanding as well. And one of the that's another reason why First Nations refuse to sign, because Canada insists on removal of Indian land from the protections of the Indian Act, and they, they insist that First Nations take their land in fee simple, which means it can be subject to provincial taxation, um, foreclosure, you know, all those things that happen when you hold land in fee simple as opposed to the trust relationship under the Indian Act. So you're absolutely right, and that does come, and a, and a good part of our case is focused on the comprehensive claims process and the BCTC process as just another piece, the BC piece of that national policy. So that's what we're attacking, is, you're absolutely right. Follow up, sure. What happens, um, like, is it a legal point that uh, if, you're, if the Native community is removed from the Indian Act, they're legally no longer Indians? And, like, I look upon myself as Canadian Indian, and I'm supposed to have a right to uh, my nationality, which, under the treaty process, I'm not. And, in fact, if you look at the Nishka Treaty and the Sawasan Treaty, um, those First Nations governments are now subject to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, so yes, I mean, you know, and I'm, you know, Robert's going to get upset at me, but here's, I, I spent a lot of time with the BC treaty process. 
I first got involved with this in, in 1999. I gave a talk at UPC, um, and Carrier Seconde came up to me and said, you know, we're very interested in this U.S. Indian law model of sovereignty. You know, we, we would like sovereignty, but the government says we can't have that in our treaty. And if you look at the Nish Nishka Treaty, it basically says the Nishka are a municipal model of government. We would like you to draft what a sovereignty treaty would look like. And so I, I, with a group of six students in my law clinic, went paragraph through paragraph through the Nishka Treaty, which is the template for the BCTC process, and basically rewrote it. And having studied those tr that treaty process, it's termination. What it has meant, it gets the federal government out of the Indian business because it turns over jurisdiction to the province over Indian land. It gets rid of the special tax exemptions that tribes have. And so it's really a termination policy. And I think that's exactly why the vast majority of First Nations say, no, we're not gonna go, we're not gonna self-terminate. We're not gonna self-execute ourselves. So, but then I wanna get to another question, one more, yes. Um, do you know anything about uh, the case of Bruce Clark who represented the, um, uh, there was a lake up north, uh, they told the, the name of the lake, they had an armed uprising. Yes, yes. Gustafson Lake, yes. Yeah. He represented those people and, and um, his position was brought to his, his saying that, uh, you know, this is unceded land and the authority of this court is in question. Mm -hmm. And as far as I understand, they ran him out of the country and took away his ability to practice law. Is, should I be concerned? No, <laughs> you know, I don't know the case. I'm just kidding, but it doesn't surprise me. Yes, I saw another question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> how, how are you able to get the narrative of what you're telling us, which I presume most of us understand, across, and, and that's a small fraction of the non-Indigenous uh, people in Canada, how do you get that narrative across to the people who say, what do they want? I'm tired of my taxes going to, there's such a divide between right. that. And I would think that you would need at least a significant minority to come along and understand. Well, I think the first place you start with is the way you train your lawyers, okay? Um, you know, I've been teaching law for 32 years. I've taught India law. I, I sort of know that if you take a certain position, you're going to end up at a certain point. Um, and I think First Nations lawyers started down the road around the time of Delgamo. That was a mistake. And that the doctrine of discovery should have been challenged at the outset. And so I think you need lawyers trained in law school to understand that the Canadian model does not provide due process, it does not follow the rule of law, you have an ethical obligation to do everything you can to defeat it, instead of enabling the government by upholding it. You know, what I'm fearful of is in the Shilkotan case, that the Shilkotan are so concerned with losing everything that they might be willing to compromise to take a little, and thereby further embed the principles of the doctrine of discovery. And so, you know, that's a, that, that could be a very difficult decision, and I can understand. I perfectly understand why the Sawas and Anishka signed their treaties. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I think a First Nation can make that determination and say it's our own interest, but a lot of First Nations have said, no, we're not. And I think you're right. There's a lot of lack of understanding of why they're saying no. But I think it does start with the way that we train lawyers. Um, and let's face it, I mean, just as in the United States, it's hard to get press coverage for these issues. You know, that the, that the majority media isn't really as interested in that. They're interested in all the horrible things. Or any honest. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I can't fix U.S. society. Don't ask me to start helping you. Don't you know what I mean? I'm still mystified by you. You're also polite, you know. We're, we're really confrontational. I mean, I was Tom Lumby, you know, we get in people's face. Um, it's just such a different cultural style with the Lakota Sioux. I deal with the Navajo. Um, I can tell you that U.S. tribes are so much more aggressive and are so much more confrontational and are so willing, as you said in Gustafson, you know. You know what's great in this Shilkoten case, if you read the Court of Appeals opinion, it started with a blockade. I mean, it started from that type of social activism, and here's what happened. You've got all that energy in the community. People are willing to put their lives on the line. They're willing to get arrested. They take a stand. The government pays attention, and then the lawyers take over, and you put it in the court. 
And what you end up doing is when you go into court, you dissipate all that energy, you put the issue in the hands of experts rather than the community, and the community doesn't know how to talk to those experts. And then they come back 10 years later and say, this is the best we could get you, here's the bill. So that's the problem. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about your uh, doctrine of discovery as a corollary effect. It's called the divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a real epidemic here. Um, we say that with Carrier's County, uh, the mining enterprise up there, they talk about the carrier that excludes the county. Mm -hmm. So there are odds. Yeah. And uh, I'm just putting it out that uh, there has to be a unified indigenous voice in the jurisdiction of Canada. Because the divide and conquer gets used jurisdictionally through provincial federal arguments, municipalities, yeah. through organizations. And uh, in 1996, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples actually uh, made a recommendation for an Aboriginal Parliament in Canada. Uh, of course, none of the recommendations in that report have ever been followed because it puts too much power in the hands of Indigenous people here. But a lot of that work has been done. And that, uh, I have a funny story about the Royal Commission. So Paul Chartron, a Menti lawyer, was one of the first uh, you know, indigenous peoples who sat on the Royal Commission. And so part of Canada's 1,200-page response was, well, the Royal Commission addressed all these issues. And in fact, uh, we just issued a report, and they copied the report, a 200-page report called Gathering Strength, you know, the Royal Commission 10 years later. And they said, this proves how great we are. So I got Paul Sharptron to issue an affidavit which said, gathering strength is wrong. It should be called gathering dust. <laughs> <laughs> Love that Canadian sense of humor. I thought that was great. Yes, sir. Does the, uh, the Attica Convention of 1969 have any applicability to what we're No, other than customary law, because Canada has not signed on um, to the mandatory JIC jurisdiction ILO, although they watch the process very carefully, but no, they haven't signed on to ILO 169, but it does contribute to the development of these customary norms of international law, as Jim talked about, which are out there and now informing application of the UN Declaration and the OAS instruments as well. Yes, another question I want to make sure I get on. Thank you again for coming. Um, as a first year law student, I, I just wrapped up my first year in Ottawa, and uh, I'm from BC, and so obviously I've worked with First Nations for quite a while. And this is this is kind of the exact uh, deadlock that, that I encountered when um, you know Dalgamook was propped up so much in our property class, and and after Dalgamook there was all this litigation, and a lot of Aboriginal communities thought this, this was the key for them. And then you have Section 35 and the duty to consult in the Williams case. And I, I guess you, you've already answered the question where I just want to know what. All this talk about the duty to consult, and, um, and with the Williams case, do you just think the Chief Justice again? You know, she she worked on Haida. She's just gonna another fuzzy gray. Come on, just try to get it together in the name of reconciliation. I I actually think they're going to use the William case as a way to get out of these cases. That they're going to set down a standard that's clear, uh, that's very minimalist, the postage stamp approach, or maybe a little bit more. Um, and if you're not careful about the way that case is argued, um, it's going to be the final word on indigenous Abori uh, Aboriginal title for the next 20, 30 years. So, I, and if you look, if you read the appellate opinion, I think it was written to serve up on a plate an approach that the Canadian Supreme Court will adopt because it will be convinced that this will put an end to all this nonsense and stop clogging up our courts with these cases that we don't feel we should decide anyway. I mean, the, the court has said repeatedly, and Justice Vickers in the William case said, these things need to be negotiated. Please, don't bother us. Negotiate them. We don't, we, and you can understand, this happened in Australia and it happens in the U.S. The seven or nine unelected judges are not going to give over 90% of the province of British Columbia to First Nations. They're unelected. And they feel that their role constrains them from basically, as the, as the court said in, in a major indigenous rights case in, in Australia, they're not going to rip out a skeletal principle of the legal system to achieve justice. If you're going to do that, get the legislature to do it. So that was why my answer is, Stop litigating! Can I, in the United States, we've got a horrible Supreme Court. I know because I lost an indigenous rights case nine to nothing, so you shouldn't be listening to me very much, okay? <laughs> but that was in 2001, and, and after that case, the Native American Rights Fund formed a project called the Supreme Court Project, and it has one goal, and that goal is to keep cases out of the Supreme Court. 
Can you imagine? So here I am, a law professor, and every lawyer, law student says, one day I'll get to argue in the Supreme Court. And I've got to tell my students, not if you're an Indian lawyer, you don't want to bring it there. But stop bringing cases to the court. You're wasting, I'm not saying, it's not my opinion. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has said, you're wasting your time. That's what, that's my point, so. Um, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but it, it, it seems to me that the bottom line of what you're saying is uh, a transfer of a lot of economic power and uh, almost political power away from where it exists now. Uh, so my question is, is there an example where there has been a, uh, an appeal to an international commission in any area of law that has resulted in this kind of uh, really revolutionary yes. Uh, changing of the uh, map. Uh, yes, two cases that my program helped bring along with Jim and I. The Augustini case, after that decision, Nicaragua amended its constitution and created an autonomy regime on the Atlantic coast in which the Mosquito, I mean, you know, man, you know the history of the Mosquitoes, they were Contras. They went to war against the Sandinistas. The leader of the Mosquito Contras was Brooklyn Rivera. He is now head of, he's the elected head of the Atlantic Autonomous Region. In Belize, uh, our program, having prosecuted an indigenous rights case on this exact theory for the Maya, we then went into domestic court in Belize and told their domestic courts that you have signed on to the OAS declaration and here's what the Inter-American Commission has said that you must recognize and demarcate. And the Belize court at the Supreme Court level adopted the position that we are going to incorporate this decision the Inter-American Commission into our own law. And so now we reverse our law, we, we recognize Aboriginal rights. Now that's Belize and that's Nicaragua, and I know they're different from Canada. Um, but there are, there are precedents out there where this stuff works. Yes? I hate to be so cynical, but... Uh, More than me? <laughs> okay. If, uh, if, if uh, everything you've been discussing is the foundation of Western civilization for a few thousand years, and to recognize uh, Aboriginal, I mean, wouldn't recognizing Aboriginal rights, which I'm in favor of, and I think right. it shouldn't have been about for a thousand years, uh, wouldn't that mean I hand over the, the keys to my house in Burnaby? And I mean, like, what is, what is the solution now? Isn't it too late? No, no it's not too late home? because there's a lot of land on Vancouver Island that hasn't been clear cut that the Hokamina people still use for gathering, for ceremonies, for their bathing, for hunting. Uh, and if, and you know, when you talk about a tremendous transfer of wealth and power, there ain't that much wealth and power left. I mean, for the Hokamina, there's very little land that they can go after. I, and the standard, and here's the thing, and, and again, this is so different from the way your lawyers think about indigenous rights. And in law school, we teach people that rights is what we call a zero-sum game. If I recognize your right, then that means I have an obligation. I'm going to lose something, right? So anytime you argue rights, particularly for a minority, my professor at Harvard Law School was Derek Bell. He's African-American, founder of critical race theory. He invented this, this great, he said, all you need is one idea. And here's my one idea that made me famous. It's called the interest convergence dilemma. Sounds real. The interest convergence dilemma. And here's what it says. White people ain't going to do nothing for black people unless it's in their own interest. Duh, in a democracy, the majority won't do anything for the minority unless it's in their interest. People, you know, I tell my students, they spent 500 years conquering you and taking away from you. They're not gonna give it away in one judicial decision. They fought too hard for it. No, I mean, what we're really asking for is a minor recalibration of the equities here. You know, right now they have nothing. You know, and they're asking, and so the standard is not I don't want your house in Burnaby. We actually said that. No, listen, we actually we know that. And, and in, our, in our petition, we actually asserted that not one single small private landowner is going to be affected by this case. We are focused on the big three timber companies and those huge blocks of land they hold, which are still owned under Holcomenum custom and traditional law. And so that's what we're focused on. Is re you, know, you all talk about re reconciliation up here. Okay, how many people have heard that term? That's an accounting term. You reconcile accounts. 
That's a reconciliation. It's not saying, I'm sorry, give me a kiss and come by. Ah, you owe me this, and that has to be moved from this ledger book to this ledger book. That's real reconciliation. And that's what I'm talking about. And international law says you don't get it all because you don't, if, if you don't need it all to survive, then you don't get it all. I don't care what your rights might be under Canadian law. You may have a theoretical right to all the title, but under international law, all you get is what you need to perpetuate your culture and to have that cultural security. And it's Canada's job to figure out how much that is. And they're not doing a very good job of it at all. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, so let me tell you an example of what I think is next, all right? We, uh, Robert calls me one morning, so we're filing, um, right before our merits hearing, we're filing our merits brief, and uh, we had found out that Timber West, one of the big three timber companies, was going to be sold um, to two pension companies here. Um, huge sale. And so we'd actually finished the brief, I said, you know, let's just file precautionary measures and tell the commission about this sale and that it could dramatically affect our rights uh, and therefore we're going to try and ask to stop it. Uh, and so Robert did a little, I think, one paragraph press release that we had filed um, precautionary measures trying to stop the Timber West sales. This guy in Toronto named Richard Carlottis is one of the leading stock analysts for natural resource companies. And so Robert made sure that that press release got to him. And so in his blog, which was just focused on his big-wig investors, he just said, just got notice, Indian Group trying to stop Timber West sale. Don't buy. <laughs> their, how much did their stock drop? Their stock dropped into tens of millions of dollars. Robert gets a call from their attorney. Who the hell are you? And where did you come from? <laughs> companies, and, and this is always my point, governments don't care. But companies have what's called reputational risk. Companies have stockholders meetings. Companies have ethical practices. More and more companies are now governed by corporate standards of good behavior and recognition of human rights. And so a positive decision out of the commission will enable us to approach the pension companies that own these lands, the large timber companies, their shareholders. That's how you wage a human right campaign. We have Amnesty International. They're the experts at it. They created it. Then you get civil society engaged and recognize it for the first, oh my, I didn't know we were violating human rights. I had no idea that when BC gave us those timber licenses that we were violating human rights. China had no idea there were aboriginal title interests there, but you get that decision. And then what that does is create an environment in which you have what I call the mo ground, the moral high ground. You know, and right now, First Nations don't have the mo ground because people think, you know, they want it all. Or they want to go back to the 1500s. And no, you've got to change the discourse to get people to start talking about this, not in a right zero-sum game type of way, but rather as absolutely essential to the cultural survival of these indigenous peoples. And that within 20 or 30 years, if we don't do something to stop that clear-cutting, there's not going to be First Nations anymore practicing their traditional way of life and their customs and adapting the way they feel is necessary. So that's what's next. You take these decisions and you just use them any way you can. Because the government doesn't have to pay attention to it unless people make them pay attention. And quite frankly, the only things your government, the only people your governments pay attention to are corporations. And so when you get the corporations and when you get church groups and telling them about the moral issues that are involved here, it changes the discourse. You need to change the discourse. You need to stop talking about this nonsense of Delgamook and this nonsense of Aboriginal rights and this nonsense of an integral relation to your society and get out of that racist language grounded in 3,000 years of war against indigenous peoples and start talking the language of the 21st century, human rights. And that's my point to you, that we've imagined, I, you know, I may not look that old, but you know, I'm 58. I was there you know, from the beginning at the working group. And nobody ever thought you would connect, Paul knows, Paul Joffe's here, has done a lot of work. Nobody ever thought, I mean, people are, you're not gonna get these UN diplomats to accept, this is crazy. You're dealing with the territorial integrity of states. No one's gonna agree with this, this idea. And for 10 years, indigenous people scraped up money, held fundraisers, traveled to Geneva, got 10 minute interventions, you got 10 minutes to tell your story, but they did it and they did it and they did it. 
And it's like Martin Luther King said, if you talk to a person long enough, sooner or later you'll get down to the God inside of them. And that's what you have to do. You just have to keep on talking and not give up. Yeah. And regarding treaties, does it ever come up uh, that uh, the communities that are making treaties with the federal government are not nations? Because the treaties are made between nations. It's my sort of consideration that Canadian Indians are a people in this country, and I think legally that's the case also. But in the treaty process, we're being done away with um, when these small communities uh, make, make agreements with the federal government. And, and agglomerated into these treaty groups, which oftentimes, sometimes, but oftentimes really have no connection to the traditions, customs, and culture of, of the groups that have been assembled in these rather artificial assemblages. That's why you have situations like Malmuth, where groups break off from the treaty group. Because again, they can't hold that coherence. So, yeah, I agree with you. Am I done? You had enough. <laughs> okay. All right. inspiring, passionate, illuminating, elucidating speech because um, what my, uh, the, the problem we all face, we spend our lives trying to swim to the surface and we try to swim to the surface through the muck and mire of, of cultural mores and historical nonsense and bullshit and one of the things that we know in, in British Columbia right now that we know because of the, um, partly because, largely because maybe of what the First Nations people are doing in resisting um, uh, crazy things like Enbridge and, and the um, twinning of the pipelines and so on. So it's like these people that have, we've had our boot on their neck for hundreds of years and now it's those people who are rising up and saying um, we're going to save uh, the land for us and for you. So I just have to thank you so very much. You've so inspired me. I just loved every word. I'd like to sit and hear it over and over again. No, buy my book. <laughs> what Rob said and treats this his lecture as a beginning point, not as an end point, but a beginning point in learning about international law because international law is at a very, very, law is at an important juncture because our law, like Canadian law, that we all say, oh, isn't that wonderful? Well, it isn't. It isn't at all because the law was fashioned to protect wrongly acquired privilege. You know what I mean? And and what, what was happening, what happened with First Nations at the same. So, but now there's an opportunity that you're outlining so, so uh, passionately and beautifully that international law now can start shaping domestic law. But it can, if we stand up and say, we don't care what the storyline is about why we need to um, have uh, you know, develop the tar sands in order to live. We don't have to know that. And so I just wanted to say in closing, one thing, one person said, what can you do? You can do this. You can just keep advocating for human rights. And what this man said about, will it mean I have to give up my house? I say, maybe it will. Because you can never solve a problem by saying, oh, what? You know, like we, slavery would have gone on if you'd said, but how would I run the cotton farm? Like, so you, you say you're going to stop something, that you're going to go another way, and then it's another way. Then you have to discover what that other way would be. So thank you so much. Thank you.